All right, today it's all about exploration. Um, you should have a set of guided notes that look something like that. And we're going to get right into it. So, big ideas. We want to know why Iberians, aka Portuguese and Spanish people on the Iberian Peninsula, why those people in particular began exploring the Atlantic and Indian Oceans in the 1400s and into the 1500s. And we also want to know what the consequences of their exploration were. Um, Schreer did a nice, uh, a nice job of kind of, kind of outlining um, what European colonies were like in this period and how they were different from the empires that came before them. He talked about them being maritime empires, and maritime empires really just means uh, over water, over ocean. And one of the most important things about maritime empires is that they are not uh, adjacent or they are not contiguous territories spreading out from the mother country. They are separated from the mother country, um, in this case by um, like the Atlantic Ocean, the Indian Ocean, etc. So if you would, um, if you would um, right beside uh, or maybe right up at the top of your notes, just note that we're going to be talking about um, the beginnings of these maritime empires. Maritime is M-A-R-I-T-I-M-E, T-I-M-E. So um, we're going to be talking about maritime empires, why people from the Iberian Peninsula, which contains both Portugal and Spain, why they are the first to go out and then what the consequences were. So let's start first with why they actually go out um, and explore. Other European nations will join in with this uh, exploration um, movement, but they'll come later. Um, but other nations, uh, France, um, Britain, the Netherlands especially is a big one. Um, they will join in, but Spain and Portugal are the first to go. All right. Uh, the first reason um, I kind of defined as two years, 1257 and 1492 CE. These are the years that um, Reconquistas happened. And the uh, Reconquista refers to reconquering land um, on the Iberian Peninsula that had been held by um, Muslims. And those Muslims had come over way back in the day, in the uh, seven and eight hundreds, and they had conquered territory within the Iberian Peninsula, and they had um, set up states. We looked, for example, in time period three at the uh, Muslim city in Spain called Cordoba. It had that uh, really cool mosque with the striped arches. Uh, that is the um, group who was eventually kicked out. And what it means to reconquer, it's definitely set in terms of um, religious conflict. Christians, um, Christian Spaniards, viewed themselves as reconquering land for Christianity and kicking out Muslims who had, um, who had controlled that area. So, um, that Reconquista, that mindset and that process of warfare that eventually led um, to um, Christians becoming in control of the Iberian Peninsula again, that mindset really led them to a sense of nationhood. And of course that nation, nationhood was framed in terms of the ideology of Christianity. Um, it was uh, a dualistic nature, right? Uh, Muslims who had ruled Spain versus Christians who wanted to rule Spain. So that dualistic um, setup sort of led the people who conquered the Iberian uh, Peninsula to really be um, very wrapped up in that ideology of Catholic Christianity specifically. Um, and one of their reasons that they're going to give later on for going out and exploring and conquering new territory, especially in the Americas, is that they would be able to convert new people to Christianity. So you'll see that um, ideology of Christianity will come up again and again. So if you would, uh, put a, maybe a double underline um, under the ideology, that word right there, ideology and Christianity. Because those are two, um, th that concept is a really important one to keep in mind long term as we talk about these nations that went out exploring. Second big reason for uh, that pushed Europeans to go out into the Atlantic and begin um, exploring was plague. At the end of the Pax Mongolica, the uh, bubonic plague began to spread out from Central Asia, 
to mostly um, urban areas. It hit very hard in the Middle East. It hit very hard in China. And of course, it hit Europe as well, uh, killing something like uh, up to one third, um, maybe even one half of the population in urban centers. So this obviously disrupts land trade routes and luxury goods become scarce when there is a supply problem that causes an increase in price. So this is a perfect time to work to make money through trade. If luxury goods are scarce and expensive and I can get my hands on some, I'll be able to make a ton of money. So that's what Europeans were thinking. Collapse of the Pax Mongolica is the same issue. When centralized government fell across Eurasia at the end of the uh, Mongol peace period, um, trade also began to decline. The routes became very unsafe. But the desire for the luxury goods that had been carried along the Silk Roads didn't dissipate with the collapse of the Mongols. In fact, if anything, the desire for those luxury goods was growing as especially Europeans had more money um, to actually buy those kinds of goods. So as Europe began to sort of recover from their period, the medieval period, they um, had more money to spend on luxury goods and they wanted those luxury goods just as much as they did before. So again, it's that question of uh, supply and demand. The supply was low, not only because of the plague, but also because of the end of the Pax Mongolica. Therefore, um, you could make a lot of money if you managed to be the one to get your hands on some of those luxury goods. The next is another issue with trade. Constantinople fell to an empire called the Ottoman Empire in 1453. This is something that we've already discussed in class. Um, Constantinople was the capital city of the Byzantine Empire. It sat right here at the entrance to the Black Sea and uh, the Mediterranean Sea. And Constantinople was the capital of the Byzantine Empire. And as the Ottoman state got stronger and stronger and began to expand, uh, the Byzantine Empire kept losing territory to them until pretty much they only had the city of Constantinople. Finally, um, Mehmet the Conqueror um, in 1453 laid siege to the city, and of course it eventually fell, and that was the end of the Byzantine Empire. Um, that meant that Muslim empires were in control of trade routes and trade goods that Europeans wanted. So here we can see Italy, here we can see the Ottoman Empire. This is where those goods traditionally had been in transit. Um, all of this area down here is also held by uh, Muslims at the time. So kind of all this stuff that they want, it's over here in the black edge that is uh, Asia. All that stuff that they wanted had to go this way to get to Europe. The problem was that there weren't any really good trading partners there um, because, again, this is a very religious time period. Uh, Europeans were very uh, ideologically um, tied to Roman Catholic Christianity. Muslims, of course, were very tied to um, Islam. And it would have been easier if Europeans had been able to have some Christian trading partners over here, but their last Christian trading partner was gone. So same thing again, the price of luxury goods began to rise, but the desire for those luxury goods did not abate. So the problem is how can Europeans get luxury goods and bypass all the different Muslim states that are kind of blocking their access to Asia. And that's when some Europeans start thinking, you know what, maybe we should stop trying to go east. Maybe we should look to going west instead. The other thing that's really going to help Europe, the last of the um, reasons that this is really the era when they begin exploration, is um, their inventions and their desires. So um, over the period of the Pax Mongolica, a number of very important inventions traveled across the Silk Roads and the um, Indian Ocean Maritime System and reached Europe um, because, especially of the stability created through the Pax Mongolica across those land routes, Europeans finally had access to Chinese inventions like the compass and gunpowder and uh, paper, which I didn't actually write on here, if you would, uh, out to the side of those um, important um, technologies, compass, caravel ship, astrolabe, sextant, gunpowder. Will you add paper, please? Just put and paper. Um, the caravel 
is a really important thing. It is um, a very small ship. It's the one that's on the top of your November calendar. Um, and it was compared to uh, Zheng Ke's uh, treasure ship. But that little tiny caravel ship is actually a great, great ship for the Atlantic Ocean. The Atlantic Ocean is kind of notoriously uh, difficult to traverse. It has a lot of storms and uh, difficult currents. And if you had a huge ship like Zheng Ke's um, ship that he took into the Indian Ocean, where the uh, waves are a lot calmer, it would probably break apart. So uh, the caravel was really good because it's just very small. So it could kind of roll with those swelling waves and just um, kind of roll with the punches. So the caravel ship was actually a really great um, ship for, um, for the purposes that Europeans wanted them for. The astrolabe and sextant are both um, instruments developed in the Islamic world, and they are used for um, navigation. Of course, gunpowder is another Chinese invention. Europe is, of course, the one who takes that gunpowder, um, as we talked about in class just the other day. They take gunpowder, and because of all of the constant warfare in the European continent um, amongst all those tiny little nation states and all those tiny little city states, there's a really quick technological innovation. And so um, Europe was really well equipped and ready to go out exploring. They had the technology that they needed. Um, there's a revival of trade, of course. We've been talking about that. And the most important thing, uh, a big llama beside this point, there's a desire for trade to acquire Asian luxury products. That's the reason that this exploration occurs, um, not for any other reason. The goal is to get luxury products. Governments in Europe knew that this would be a very lucrative prospect. So the governments, the kings and queens who ruled these small nation states um, were actually willing to sponsor exploration um, in the hopes that they would be making money off of it. And the most famous of those are um, probably um, Castile and Aragon. Uh, Ferdinand and Isabella ruled these states and um, they actually uh, will be the ones to finance Columbus, for example, who went out hoping to reach Asia to bring back a bunch of luxury goods to sell and make money. All right, we're gonna talk about Portuguese exploration a little bit more specifically. The red trade routes that we see here, this is the IOMS that had been in existence for forever, as well as the Silk Roads that had been in existence for forever. So, um, Along this way, you go through the Strait of Malacca, you can go around India, you can go all the way down here, the Swahili coast of East Africa, uh, to ports like Kilwa, way down here, and Great Zimbabwe, way down there. Um, you could go across um, Eurasia on land routes. What Portugal will do is in blue. Finally, Portugal, and you can see it's kind of logical, right? The geography is great for going out into the Atlantic. They could leave from their capital at Lisbon, and they could attempt to get around Africa and enter the Indian Ocean by going around Africa. The most important thing to remember about Portuguese exploration is that their goal is to go around Africa and into the Indian Ocean. Okay. Geographically, like I said before, it's natural for Portugal to actually go and explore routes in the Atlantic Ocean. They're right there on the ocean. Um, they also have some um, ruling elites who are very keen on the idea. The most important of these is Prince Henry the Navigator. Put a little llama beside his name. Prince Henry the Navigator is um, a member of the royal family of Portugal, and he, his goal is really to um, get to the gold that exists in Africa. He doesn't even have the kind of far-sighted thinking to think, hey, let's get around uh, Africa and go into the Indian Ocean. His goal is really to just get to um, West Africa where all the gold is. And so what he does is open up a school where um, Europeans, Portuguese specifically, could learn uh, maritime technologies. This is a great example, again, of government support of exploration to seek out trade and make money. Um, for example, uh, at this school, they studied uh, cartography, which is map making. They made improvements on the um, navigational devices like the compass and the astrolabe. And they also uh, helped to refine this ship right here, which is the caravel. Out to the side of the caravel ship right here, out to the side of that bullet point, I want you to note that the caravel has triangular sails. 
So I want you to note right out to the side of Caravel ship that it has triangular sails. I'd also like you to note that it has a rudder on the back of the boat. That was an innovation. That right there is the rudder. So triangular sails and a rudder, R-U-D-D-E-R, -D -D -E on the back of the boat. Those are two really important innovations um, that made the Caravel a little bit sturdier. It made it, um, with triangular sails, able to tack into the wind. They didn't just have to have the wind at their back in order to move forward. They could move forward using these triangular sails even when the wind was coming straight at them. This is an innovation that we saw way earlier. We actually saw this in time period two when we read the article called Southernization. Um, it talked about Malay sailors from Indonesia using this kind of triangular sail to sail into the wind. Um, their first action was actually an attack on a city called Ceuta, which is very far in North Africa. Literally, you can probably see it from um, the coast of Spain. So uh, it's just right across the coast in um, North Africa. And when they get there, it's kind of awash in gold. And the Portuguese um, are extremely, extremely excited about this. What they want more than anything is wealth and the ability to have luxury products and luxury products could be purchased with gold and gold itself is a luxury product. The Portuguese kind of realize the kind of wealth that they don't have and the kind of wealth that places like those huge West African empires that we were studying, like uh, the East Asian empires and the Indian empires all have. Europe wants that. All right, uh, over time, Portugal's goal expands and they realize that they don't just want to reach West Africa and the gold, they would love to go all around the entire coast of Africa and get into uh, the Asian trading system that exists. They knew that the Indian Ocean Maritime System existed, but geographically they were so separate from it that they couldn't join in on the action. What they wanted to do is figure out how can we get our ships from here in Portugal to there in the Indian Ocean and take part with all of that awesome trade that's going on. How can we get rich? How can we have access to luxury goods? So they moved down very slowly uh, across the African coast. Um, they learned how to navigate. They learned uh, the currents. They learned the wind patterns. And very slowly, over the course of about 80 years, they actually make their way all the way down the African coast and then around the southern tip of Africa. In the meantime, they also encounter the huge West African empire of Songhai that we have already talked about. They will actually lease a port in the West African empire of Songhai um, and trade for gold and ivory there peacefully. This is a really cool indicator about uh, Portugal's relative importance as compared with these really big centralized empires that we um, have already been talking about. They were not strong enough to dominate. I know a lot of times we imagine or we have learned in the past that Europe kind of went out in the 1500s and blew up everybody and dominated the universe. This is definitely not the case. Europe is beginning to have more of a role in the world during time period four, but they are definitely not a dominating force. The old empires of West Africa, the Middle East, uh, South Asia, and East Asia are really much, much stronger than Europe at this time. And um, the fact that Portugal leases peacefully a West African port instead of just blowing up a port and taking it for themselves and using it is a really good indicator of the relative uh, power that European nations actually had, which was fairly low. Now, Africans feel like this is a decent trade though. Um, they get money for Europeans to lease the port and they also had access to um, some of the really good technology that Europe had. Remember, Europe was constantly at war with one another because it is not centralized, because um, there are a lot of city-states and small nation-states constantly fighting one another. There's an arms race going on. And although uh, China is the inventor of gunpowder, Europe is the inventor of the cannon. Europe is the inventor of the Harkbus, the really early gun that we saw in the video Gun Strength and Steel. So, Europe is sort of the originator of all the things that kill people really effectively. Now, West African rulers on the coast um, are also creating more centralized states, even outside of Songhai. Other smaller states are kind of consolidating their power. They also wanted access to those weapons so that they could consolidate their rule. Europe can trade with them. Europe can get gold and ivory in exchange for weapons. So it's a pretty good deal. Um, here we can see an uh, early um, European map of the west coast of Africa. 
you can see how carefully they map out kind of all the intricacies as they go around that West African bulge. Here you can see the little port that um, the Portuguese leased from Songhai, and that's where they did their trading. You can see uh, the little European ships kind of plying the waters and doing their trading. At this time, the sugar and slave cycle also began, and it began very slowly at first, but by the time we get into the 1600s, it will have uh, really become a full-blown uh, economic machine. Uh, as Portugal and later Spain kind of move out into the Atlantic Ocean, they encounter um, islands which are well in the tropical zone. And what Europeans realize is that they could take the techniques first created by Muslims in the Mediterranean and Indian Oceans, and they could use those same methods to grow sugar. If you guys will remember, we talked about sugar as a luxury good. Sugar originated in Southeast Asia, sugarcane, and that plant, the sugarcane, was transferred into um, the Indian Ocean and into the Mediterranean area. And um, the plantation system really arose um, as a uh, Islamic contribution to um, sort of how to grow and process sugar. Europeans um, built on that and um, they took the idea first created in India of how to granulate sugar turn it from cane juice into like a bag of sugar like you pick up the grocery store today. So Europeans are super, super stoked about this um, opportunity that they have now that they own a couple things in a tropical um, environment. That was one of Europe's problems before. They didn't have any, um, they weren't in the tropics, so a lot of the luxury goods that uh, were saleable on the market, Europe didn't have access to. It was just too cold up there to grow a lot of the cool stuff that people wanted to purchase in the trading system. Now they've got access to a tropical area, they're going to begin growing sugar. Because of the location of these islands, they will actually be purchasing slaves who um, were POWs back in West Africa from those wars of consolidation that was going on, and they would purchase those West African slaves and ship them out to um, these small islands in the Atlantic Ocean, and they would grow sugar. And this is the very beginnings of what we call the Atlantic system. And this is an equivalent to the um, Indian Ocean Maritime System. It is just another trading system. This one not centered on the Indian Ocean, but on the Atlantic Ocean. I pulled up Google Earth for you guys and went ahead and um, uh, pinned these two locations. Up here we see the Madeira Islands and down here the Canary Islands. Um, and you can see here's the Iberian Peninsula. Um, Portugal is right there. Spain is right there. Ceuta, the place that Portugal attacked, is actually right up there. You can see how close Africa and the Iberian Peninsula are to one another. They nearly touch. Way over here, you can see the coast of what is today the United States. There's Florida, uh, Cuba, there's uh, Brazil down here. Okay, so these little islands are where Europeans kind of first encountered as they went around the coast of Africa, and they started growing sugar there. Oh, and of course you can see, here's of course the west coast of Africa, so it's easy access to um, uh, purchase uh, slaves who would be able to work that sugar. All right, um, West African kingdoms were also in the process of empire building, as I mentioned before, but I wanted to delve into it just a little bit more. Um, you need to know a few names. I'd like you to put a giant llama beside the second bullet point, Congo, Benin, and Angola. These are three um, emerging West African centralized states. Songhai, of course, is still there. Um, it's a little bit to the north of these three states that we're looking at now. Um, these West African empires were using male POWs from African wars of uh, consolidation and expansion, and they were selling them to Europeans in that new and emerging Atlantic system. Europeans were giving them guns for those slaves, and then that cycle continued. So what would happen is, the, the uh, say uh, you're Congo or Angola, you get some POWs, you sell them to Europeans, you get guns and cannons, you go out, you conquer your neighbor, you get more POWs, which are prisoners of war, you sell them to Europeans, you get more guns and cannon, conquer more ter territory, more POWs, etc. So um, the slave trade in the very beginning in the uh, 1500s kind of time period is very much controlled by Africans. 
Um, but after about 100 years, the desire by Europeans for slaves to um, work plantations in the colonies that they're going to begin building in the Americas becomes insatiable. And Europeans will begin um, using some pretty sketchy uh, tactics to get slaves out of West Africa and into um, agricultural work in their colonies. And this is going to really disrupt population patterns. Uh, so many are taken into slavery, and usually men, because uh, men were the preferred uh, gender to do agricultural labor. It's really going to throw off like uh, the gender distribution of West Africa. It's called some uh, pretty weird uh, family patterns and um, gender disparities among the West Africans who remain um, in Africa. In fact, um, more Africans than any other ethnic group migrate to the Americas. Now, of course, they are migrating through force, but you get more than 10 million um, Africans leaving this west coast of Africa and going to the Americas to uh, work plantations. You can see most of them wind up way down here in what will become Brazil. Um, another um, almost 5 million go to the Caribbean. Of course, what they're doing there is growing sugar. Those are tropical areas. And you can see this represents the sugar plant. So anywhere you see this sugar plant, you know that that's what um, the slaves are being taken to do. Um, we will go more into detail with slavery um, in future chapters, but I just wanted to kind of give you a heads up on what's uh, going to be coming. All right. Now, the Portuguese, despite all these waylays around the uh, western coast of Africa, will eventually reach the Indian Ocean, um, Vasco da Gama sails around the very tip of Africa and reaches the Indian Ocean in uh, 1497 and 1498. He goes to the port of Calicut. Um, he trades for luxuries, mostly pepper, which is grown on the west coast of uh, India. And um, later on, these explorations will lead to a really wide swing around the West African coast. And um, I think it's Cabral, actually, who's a different explorer kind of runs into Brazil accidentally. He was making a really wide swing around Africa and just happens to run into, um, runs into um, Brazil. If you go back to this, you can kind of see how it happened. He goes to make a wide swing and boop, he runs into Brazil. So, um, in terms of um, the Indian Ocean maritime system, there were a lot of changes that occurred because of um, because of the entrance of the Portuguese into the Indian Ocean. Before the Portuguese entered, there was no centralized control over the trade. Traders just um, operated independently of governments. Uh, so if you wanted to be a trader, you were a trader, you had a trading company, you had partners. Um, we talked about, for example, the uh, Jewish diaspora, which um, was the sort of uh, spread of um, families across uh, the Indian Ocean region to create trading networks. Um, the Portuguese don't operate that way. Their government is the one who's financing and backing all of this trade. They are not individual traders. And for that reason, there's a huge amount of military force and, that is organized and financed by the government that's introduced into the ILMS. Um, you'll be reading a little bit about it coming up when you read the article uh, called Spice Seekers. And you'll see that the Portuguese are not afraid um, to use any kind of gunpowder weapons, for example, to take control of trading ports or to force um, other people to trade with them. Um, a lot of European governments feel that it's important to invest money and military might into the success of these trading missions because there's so much money at stake. All right. You can see there's the Portuguese leaving Lisbon, going around the coast. There's uh, Diaz rounding the Cape and the Gama, uh, going later all the way over here to Calicut and Goa on the uh, what's called the Malabar coast of India, where they grow pepper. At its height, all the stuff in red is what Portugal actually eventually owned. Um, most of it, look at the tiny, tiny little dots everywhere, little islands, little coastal port cities. Most of what Portugal owned is little, small, what the AP exam calls coastal enclaves. And we need to put um, this out to the side um, on our paper. Just note that 
the Europeans gained coastal enclaves. They do not, for the most part, create huge empires. Uh, they just did not have the power to do so. They did have the power to own small trading areas, and that's about it. All right, let's talk about the Spanish. Um, I've got some lines pointing at uh, Spanish exploration here for you. Anything in blue, here's the voyages of Columbus, for example. Um, over here, we've got Magellan. And I don't think that I have him on your notes today, so will you actually add him out to the side? Magellan is spelled M-A-G-E-L-L-A-N. M-A-G-E-L-L-A-N. And Magellan is the first, uh, well, his crew is the first to actually circumnavigate the globe. And that's why he's important. He actually dies over here in the Philippines. He never makes it. Um, but his crew finally makes it around the whole of the globe and um, they are uh, of, of Spanish descent, they're a Spanish crew. So Magellan's an important person uh, in the same way that Columbus was. All right, Spain, why do they go out? Well, they need a non-Portuguese dominated route and their monarchs, of course, purposefully for that purpose, sponsor Christopher Columbus to go out and figure out a different way to get to Asia. Their goal is not to find a new world, to explore without purpose. Their goal is to get to Asia and trade luxury goods. And their goal is to do it differently than the Portuguese did it. The Portuguese were already going around Africa. You can see that in purple. The Spaniards needed a different route. So they go out and seek it. Eventually they will actually uh, split the globe hilariously uh, between themselves. They'll draw an imaginary line through the middle of the Atlantic Ocean. They'll say, oh, Portuguese stuff, that's on the right side and Spanish stuff's on the left. Um, it's a ridiculous idea, of course. Um, they couldn't actually control most of that at all in any way, shape, or form. They just weren't powerful enough, but whatever. All right. Um, Christopher Columbus's discovery of the Caribbean allows Spain to expand the sugar-growing enterprises that were already going on in the Atlantic Ocean, and they also allowed them to have a jumping-off spot for the people called the conquistadors to uh, create colonies in the Americas. The Spanish will conquer first the Aztecs in 1519, and then the Incas, as we watched in our video in 1632, when they conquer these groups, they are definitely helped by groups who had previously been conquered by those empires. For example, we learned that the Aztecs and the Incas were both tribute empires, meaning that they forced the people that they conquered to pay uh, in the form of usually luxury goods um, tribute to the capital city where, of course, the majority uh, ethnic group and conquering ethnic group uh, lived really good lives that were based on exacting tribute from the other groups that they had conquered. Of course, those other groups are not happy with that scenario, and so when the Spaniards show up, they think, ah, oh, here's an ally that can help us overthrow the Aztecs who are really uh, collecting too much tribute from us. Uh, here's someone who can help us overthrow the Incas. We were really mad when they uh, conquered us. Also diseases like smallpox, we've talked about that already. Um, Spain in and of itself would not have been able to conquer these huge empires of the Aztecs and Incas without some kind of uh, serious advantage on their side. Um, for example, diseases like smallpox. Spain will eventually carve out a really large empire. I wanted to you to see how far north it goes technically. Um, Coronado and a number of other um, explorers were moving way up here into what is today the American Southwest, all of modern-day Mexico, of course down through Central America and into South America, um, modern Argentina and Chile. Uh, Brazil, of course, was held by Portugal through the Treaty of Torrecillas and through their accidental running into it as they uh, kind of circled around Africa. All right. After Portugal and Spain's exploration, Europe finally has a trading system that they can participate in. Other European nations like the Netherlands, England, and France will soon get in on the trading game, and this system is going to be called the Atlantic system. And of course you can see why, because it's all based on the Atlantic Ocean, trade between these areas, West Africa, and Europe. So the Americas, West Africa, Europe, the Americas, West Africa, Europe, that system. Um, and the luxury goods that it was producing, for example, sugar, will form the basis of a new system of trade that will result in growing wealth and importance for Europe throughout time period four. 
Um, here we can see um, some examples of goods that are traded throughout the Atlantic system. And again, you can see the places that are connected. The Americas connected with West Africa and with Europe. That is it for um, today. Um, Strayer was very brief on a lot of the sort of um, basics of exploration. So um, please let me know if anything is confusing or um, doesn't make sense. Um, hopefully you understand why Portuguese and Spanish um, sailors began exploring the Atlantic Ocean in the 1400s. You can understand some of their motivations and some of the advantages that they had. And hopefully you can see that the consequence, of course, was the beginning of some maritime empires that will be very important uh, throughout time period for us. So um, I hope that you guys find this useful and uh, let me know, of course, again, if you have any questions.